Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Terrence Pitts, and I'm a senior research and advocacy fellow at the Center on Race, Inequality, and the Law at NYU School of Law. We're thrilled to have you join our Race, Tech, and Justice Salon today. We're also excited to co-host today's discussion with a group of extraordinary panelists, who I will introduce in a second. Since you've tuned in, you're already familiar with some of the privacy and racial justice harms stemming from the use of AI-driven tech in the criminal legal system. We know the drill. Acoustic sound detection systems like ShotSpotter, facial recognition, automatic license plates readers, pretrial risk assessment instruments, voice prints, probabilistic DNA analysis, you get the point. But we're gonna take you on a different journey today. We're gonna to explore how researchers are using innovative methods fueled by natural language processing to systematically analyze past decisions in California's parole decision-making machinery. Now we aim to ground the discussion around the principles of fairness, transparency, and equity. Okay, allow me to briefly introduce our panelists so we can jump in. We've dropped uh, links de uh, to detailed bios of our panelists in the, in the uh, chat, so you can find them there. Uh, first up, we have Kristen Bell, who is an assistant professor at the University of Oregon Law, uh, School of Law. And Kristen is uh, author of The Recon Approach, a new direction for machine learning in criminal law, which is the focus of our discussion. Keith Watley is founder and executive director of Uncommon Law, an Oakland-based organization that supports individuals navigating California's discretionary parole process. Jake Searcy is a research assistant professor of data science at the University of Oregon and a research partner working with Kristen to develop the recon approach. AJ Alvero is a computational sociologist at the University of Florida, who's also working with Christian and Jake to develop the recon approach. Now, there's some other researchers that have been involved with this pro with the recon approach research, and Christian will give you background about them. Now, let's jump in. But first, a, a few housekeeping notes. When it's time for the Q&A, Zoe Chang, a second year law student in NYU, at NYU and a Paul Weiss fellow with our center, will read your questions out loud to the panelists. Also, it would be helpful if you let us know who your question's for. And please put your questions in the Q&A room and not the chat room, because that's not enabled. We plan to end promptly on the hour, and we apologize in advance if we can't get to all of your questions. Now, quickly, time for a few thanks. Uh, first, our panelists. Uh, who I'd like to thank for their willingness to share their innovative research methods and findings and powerful vision for a more just and equitable parole system in California. I'd also like to thank Jason Williamson, our center's director for his leadership, Vincent Sutherland, our co-faculty director for seeding the center's work on algorithmic justice. And finally, I'd like to thank a group of amazing policy advocates, organizers, and researchers who spent time with us last summer uh, helping us take an in-depth look at some of the racial justice implications associated with AI-driven tech in the criminal legal system. Now it's time to hear from our panelists. I'm going to pass the mic to Christian. And for some reason, if you can't access the uh, links to the bios, we will email them to you. OK, Christian, take it away. OK, thank you. All right. So uh, thank you, Terrence and the folks at NYU for hosting us today. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, being involved in this and hearing more about uh, the work that you're doing at NYU. So I just wanted to uh, uh, let folks know our gen general agenda for today. Um, so uh, we're going to start out with um, Keith Watley, who's going to provide the context for the research that we've been doing, which is California's parole system. To be very clear, I started this project not out of an interest in AI and tech, but out of an interest in reforming parole in California, um, very much led by uh, folks like Keith Watley. Um, and so he's gonna provide some context for that area of, of law and policy. Um, then I will talk about the recon approach, how we're trying to use machine learning in helping to reform parole. Um, and then my uh, collaborator, AJ, will talk about some of our high-level findings, then we'll go to Q&A. And one thing just before we start, I wanted to acknowledge the collaborators who really did the, um, the uh, brunt of the, the labor and work in uh, the approach that we have. Their names are here, but Jenny Hong, Kathleen Voss, Nick McCune, 
Johan Uganda and Graham Todd, um, all folks who are at Stanford and were really instrumental in bringing this about. Um, so with that, I will pass it on to Keith for our context about California parole. Thanks, Kristen. And thank you, Terrence, for, uh, for getting us together for this important conversation. I'm glad to be with Kristen and Jake and AJ for this conversation. Um, the this this top bullet here says a lot. It's, it's a short sentence, but um, it's really highlighting what we're seeing in California, which I think can be instructive for um, efforts across the country. Uh, I'd like to use the term selective parole, um, and, and selective parole has been a failed experiment, really, for for many decades, and, and it's not because it results in dangerous people being mistakenly released, but because it consistently is resulting in non-dangerous people being kept in prison long after they've stopped being any threat. And, and too often the reasons that they're kept in prison have much more to do with demographic identifiers than with any actual risk of violence. And when I say selective parole, I'm, I'm referring to California's system in particular, but I think the term applies to other jurisdictions where you have a group of parole commissioners deciding which people should be released from prison before the end of their sentences. While most people who are sentenced to prison, they get a fixed amount of time after which they'll automatically be released. Up to, up to a third of incarcerated people in some states will never be released unless and until the parole board says it's safe to release them. Uh, in California, we're mostly talking about people serving life sentences with the possibility of parole, and there are about 35,000 of them in this state. But we're also talking about another 10 or 15,000 people who are serving long enough determinate sentences that they get to be considered by the parole board for earlier release. <clears throat> and we have, um, we've known since the 1970s if not earlier, that there really is no scientific way to predict predict violence, even among people who've previously committed serious and violent crimes. Um, psychologists can't do it. Politicians certainly can't do it. And parole commissioners can't do it. Uh, and, and what we see is that in the absence of any scientific basis, all we have, really all any of us has to guide our 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 decisions are explicit and implicit biases, and those this, those biases disproportionately affect you know the same groups that are impacted at every other stage of our criminal legal system. Um, we we know that black folks are worse off in in school discipline and police violence and arrest rates and bail decisions and um, sentencing enhancements it really should be no surprise that um, those disparities also show up when it comes to deciding who gets out of prison. Uh, unfortunately, the, the available demographic data on parole hearing outcomes is, is very limited. Uh, but what we do see in California and in New York is that uh, Black parole candidates are consistently less likely to be granted parole than white candidates. We're also seeing the people with disabilities, um, those being treated for mental illness, those who are gender non-conforming, those who are indigent, meaning uh, they can't afford to retain their own attorneys. These folks are all less likely to be granted parole compared to um, people without those identifiers. And remember, you know, the, the, the inherent bias against these groups was known, at least anecdotally, way back in the 1970s. Uh, since then, we've tried to mitigate that bias by passing a law telling the parole board to grant parole more than they deny. We passed laws um, requiring the appointment of counsel, requiring hearings, requiring judicial review, and then requiring special consideration for certain groups, people who are young, people who are old, people who are sick, people who are survivors of domestic violence, none of those legislative changes have been able to, to overcome the, the inherent bias in this selective process. 
And I will say um, that I, I do have both concerns and hopes here. My concern is that um, too many jurisdictions may see the, the prospect of moving toward broader access to parole eligibility as meaningful reform. Uh, but without understanding and protecting against the significant risks in a selective parole process, those jurisdictions will experience the same challenges as we're seeing in California, which actually has one of the lowest parole grant rates in the whole country. At the same time, my hope, though, and I'm not sure the academics on this webinar will say this, but but I'm, I'm an advocate, uh, so I, I say it proudly. My hope is that additional data can can shine a critical light in every corner where discretionary, you know, selective decisions are being made about people's freedom. Uh, and we can take steps to limit that discretion wherever we can. That's what we need to do, I think. Um, lastly, I, I think a more robust body of research, um, greater data transparency, and really some more innovative um, approaches to analyzing the data can bring about more fairness and equity in, in parole policy. As I'm looking forward to, to hearing more about some of that research today. Thanks, Keith. I think that's my cue to share that research. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, I uh, wanted to start out really broadly just describing how myself um, and Jenny and Kelly and Nick initially thought about how the heck to apply the tools of machine learning to criminal law in general before I dive deep into parole and how we've applied that approach to parole. And this slide just shows you a, just a general description of what our approach is. So we found that a lot of the investment in technology in criminal law was toward what we called a predictive approach. Um, the object of analysis is people who are put through the system of criminal law and there are tools and alg algorithms and all kinds of things designed um, to predict their behavior. So police uh, use predictive policing techniques, um, judges use algorithms when thinking about bail and sentencing, all these kinds of things. The object of analysis is the people who are put through the system. And the thought is let's provide um, more technological tools to get better information about those people so then the decision makers can use that information. And that kind of use of technology really as a predictive device um, has been uh, criticized and um, and also defended. And uh, what we decided was we don't want to do that. We want instead for the object of our analysis to not be the people who are put through the system, but instead be the people who are making the decisions. So let's scrutinize the people who are wielding power in the system rather than those um, who are put through the system. And so our focus is on analyzing decision making in criminal law and ex ex explicitly on discretionary decision making. Um, when you have something like parole is a good example, but also um, other areas of the law where an official has broad discretion to make a decision, um, it's really unclear what is driving that discretion, especially when like in parole, the law says you can consider 15 different factors um, and it's a subjective assessment or holistic assessment. It's very difficult to understand how what's actually driving that discretion. And so we use, we call our approach the recon approach because it has two pieces, um, what we call reconnaissance and reconsideration. Um, and the idea with uh, reconnaissance is um, that's looking at a whole set of decisions um, to see patterns in those decisions. And uh, the idea is to find out if there are patterns of injustice that need structural change, um, or if the system um, seems to be on the whole working okay. Um, the second piece is reconsideration. Instead of um, thinking about 
the whole set or web of decisions and finding patterns in that. The idea of reconsideration is to identify individual cases that are anomalous with respect to other decisions. Um, so where you might have expected someone to be granted and they were instead denied. And um, when we started out um, building sort of technology for each of these um, parts to our approach, we got uh, suggestions, hey, why don't you just build a reconsideration tool? Why don't you just have that um, use natural language processing to sort through parole transcripts? And when there's one that um, is sort of an aberration from existing patterns, flag that. Um, suggest saying there's something wrong in that case should get a second look or re be reconsidered. Um, and we decided not to do that uh, because our concern is if the um, whole set of decisions has within it unjust patterns of discretion, like Keith mentioned, um, Black candidates being more likely to be denied or people who can't afford attorneys being more likely to deny to be denied. If those patterns are there, then um, a black candidate who can't afford an attorney is gonna be a lot less likely to be flagged as anomalous when they're denied. They would be in line with an existing pattern. And then our tool would be reifying those patterns of injustice rather than doing anything to rectify them. And so that's why we think the reconnaissance piece is so important to first understand what are the patterns that we're seeing in the exercise of discretion. Um, and where there are unjust patterns, you can't just rely on reconsideration, right? You need structural reform to change how those decisions are being made on the whole. Um, and then when you have a more fair system, then you can, I think, do both of these very well, because even when we've um, built a system that looks like it has no general patterns of injustice, there's still imperfection. There's still gonna be cases where discretion um, is questionable or deserves a second look. And that's why we think you need to have the reconsideration to bring things to the individual level as well. So that's more. there's more in our approach in this little uh, citation to a paper we wrote about that. Um, but now I'll move to applying it to parole. So to just understand some of our research about this, we provided this um, illustration of parole hearings in 2019, just to give you a sense of the scale of decisions and how they're made. So in 2019, there are about 6,000 uh, scheduled parole hearings. Those are hearings at which uh, California is a bit different than New York. The parole candidate appears with an attorney. Um, the district attorney may or may not be present. Victims may or may not be present. Um, and uh, there's a presiding commissioner. That's like one member from the board of parole as well as a deputy usually. Um, and so the idea of the board hearing every case is a bit of a misnomer because it's um, not as though there's a full board at every hearing but there's a presiding commissioner, a deputy commissioner. There may be additionals in certain cases, but um, after the, or at the hearing, that commissioner and deputy commissioner decide whether to deny or grant parole. Someone is granted, then the governor has an opportunity to reverse. Um, if the governor doesn't reverse, the person is released. And you can see about a thousand people were released. The rest were, um, told that they need to be reconsidered by the parole board. And in California, you have to wait between a year and 15 years to be reconsidered. And that's up to the parole board. So that's just a, a sort of basic overview of the process. And at each hearing, um, a, a PDF transcript is generated. And that's really integral to our research. Um, so what we did was collect 35, over 35,000 transcripts from uh, basically the time period when they started making them electronically available, which was 2007, up until 2019. Um, that's a total of 5 million pages of text and 700 million words. In California, 
Um, there is a right to parole transcripts, their public records. That's not true in other states. So this was really important for us to be able to do our work. Um, and when we got the transcripts, um, we, what we were doing was the reconnaissance piece, trying to find patterns in how discretion was being exercised. And um, in prior work, before I connected uh, with the folks at Stanford who introduced me to natural language processing, I had done a smaller study on parole hearing transcripts, just with um, about five, 400 transcripts of uh, people who are juvenile lifers. For each transcript, myself or a research assistant manually answered um, a number of different questions, things like, was the DA there to oppose? Did the person have a job offer? Um, what was the year of their last disciplinary write-up? And um, did an analysis of those decisions. I found, um, supporting what Keith said, uh, pe Black parole candidates were 2.7 times less likely to be granted parole. Also, people without private attorneys were 3.4 times less likely to be granted parole. But my study was limited to about 400 transcripts and just juvenile lifers. And I couldn't really scale that up given how much labor it takes to manually annotate these transcripts. So this is where um, natural language processing came in and uh, Jenny and Kathleen's work at Stanford was, well, let's train um, the tech to pull the same data that myself and research assistants were pulling from the transcripts, but do that for 35,000 transcripts. And let's see what we find doing that. So that was our approach. And we faced a lot of challenges. Um, one, the first challenge um, was just a really a tech challenge in terms of the method. It's sort of, um, I thought as a person trained in law and philosophy, oh, this is great. Just throw the NLP at it and it's going to extract all of this information. Um, and what we learned is it's just a lot harder to do that than we thought. Um, one reason is this is um, the uh, just a really short excerpt from a transcript that's about 150 pages long. And this little excerpt is talking about um, disciplinary write-ups in California. They abbreviate a disciplinary write-up as a 115 because that's the form that it's written on in the prison. Um, and uh, there isn't a statement, for example, that says you had uh, six 115s and the last 115 was in 2013. Instead, it lists a bunch of different ones and then the last date you see is 2013. And so we had, uh, it is found it very difficult to um, train the natural language processing tools to extract the questions and answers that we wanted because the transcripts themselves are so conversational um, and the data can appear like 10 pages later. So that was a technological challenge. Um, and another challenge that we had was not technological, but was political um, or legal. Uh, the uh, Board of Parole refused to give us race data because the race is not included in the transcript. Um, so we had to file a lawsuit to get that. We won, so we got our data, um, but it, it slowed our progress down considerably. Um, but uh, both of those challenges <laughs> uh, resulted in, or overcoming both of those challenges, resulted in what we think is uh, the most complete data set on parole that we have to date. Um, and just to give you a sense of what that data set is, we have the 35,000 hearing transcripts, um, and that covers about 15,700 parole candidates. The reason why um, it's only 15,000 parole candidates, but 35,000 transcripts is that each parole candidate often has multiple hearings. So it's pretty rare to get granted parole at an initial hearing, at your first hearing. Uh, usually a person will go up for parole, they'll be denied, they'll come back, they'll have another hearing, they'll be denied, they'll come back, they'll have another hearing, maybe they're granted. 
Um, so that's why uh, there's about three times as many transcripts as there are unique individuals in our data set. Um, but what this, this slide sort of um, exhibits is how we compiled our data set. So some of our data came from the transcripts um, and we had um, individual researchers and myself um, manually annotating transcripts. And then we used that as training data for the natural language processing to extract the data from the rest of the transcripts. Um, and then in addition to that, we have what we call tabular data, essentially a spreadsheet that was provided to us by the Department of Corrections that included race, um, as well as the type of attorney at the hearing and a couple of other pieces of information. Um, so you can see uh, here that A, B, and C is sort of our resulting sort of sources of data. Um, and one thing that we found really promising for just the general approach of using natural language processing to do this is that the data set that corresponds to B here, the uh, data set that was extracted by the NLP, um, was the most effective at modeling the parole decisions as a whole. And by that, I mean that um, the uh, a regression model that's built on that data set has the most predictive power. It um, is best at predicting the likelihood of whether a person would be granted or denied parole. And in addition, it had the most nuance. So some factors that we found to be significant in the decision um, in that big NLP data set weren't significant in the manual an annotation. And we think that's just because we were able to look at so many um, transcripts as like an order of magnitude larger sample size. Um, and another thing um, that we found with the NLP is that it allowed us to do more text analysis to see if there's differences in the words that commissioners use at some hearings compared to others. Um, and I'll leave discussion of that uh, to my colleague, AJ, who is going to carry on from here with some of our high level findings from this reconnaissance work. Uh, and I should say um, uh, that the, the very much preliminary findings, our first paper on this is under review and we're limited in um, kind of what we can share from the full uh, data set, but um, I'll let AJ take it away to share some highlights. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. Um, so as Kristen just mentioned, um, these 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 the final results that we're aiming to publish are still under review. So you know this is just to give you a snapshot to give you a sense of the results we've been seeing in doing this work. So first is uh, we found consistent risk of racial bias, and of course we just want to like you know put up a red flag here and note that we're still doing more work to explore this topic. And what exactly I mean by risk of racial bias will become apparent in the next slide. Another pattern we've set, we found is that there's substantial variability in the decisions, uh, in parole decisions based on the presiding uh, parole board member. Um, we have a figure for that. Uh, and then finally, we also find that uh, parole candidates were represented by a board appointed attorney as opposed to a privately retained attorney have a lower likelihood of parole. Uh, one feature of California parole is that there are no public defenders in this in in, in this at this uh, stage of the process. There are board appointed attorneys that are distinct from public defenders, and then the privately retained attorneys are privately retained attorneys. Um, so this also matters because the board appointed return attorneys use language use different language at, with different frequencies compared to the privately retained attorneys, and we also find that people of color are less likely to retain private attorneys. Go to the next slide. So here we have grant rates uh, by racial groups. So the top green bar represents uh, uh, grant rates for uh, every, basically everyone who is non-Black in our data set. 
And the blue bar right underneath for each year represents the grant rate, the parole grant rate for uh, black parole candidates. And as you can see for uh, basically every year, except for 2017 and 2016, non-black parole candidates are always more likely to get parole than black parole candidates. Something that's not immediately visible in this figure is that in 2017 and 2016, Latinx, uh, Latinx parole candidates were actually less likely to get parole than black parole candidates. So that was that was the the one twist. Um, so again, just in terms of uh, thinking temporally, uh, we 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 argue that this this is a symptom of a risk of racial bias in the system, and this is exactly what we're doing more investigation into. Next, we have commissioner variability. So as I mentioned, there's we found variation that you can you can plainly see. Uh, each green bar represents uh, parole grant rates for a particular commissioner in the California parole system. So something to note here is that uh, decisions are there's one parole board member. So if you have if you're if you have if your parole uh, commissioner is you know on the left hand uh, the the bar on the bottom left of this figure that you have a like about a three percent or five percent chance of parole just like randomly. And if your parole commissioner is the, the tallest bar on the right-hand side, you have about a 50% chance just randomly. Um, so I think, uh, you know, there is a big, a big caveat here in that, um, so there is, there's is differences in the types of prisons and the types of uh, parole cases that commissioners are assigned. So there's some variability that we're, we're kind of like, we're not going into. If we can go to the next one. So here we, we have patterns of uh, privately retained attorneys versus the board appointed attorneys. So uh, for each word uttered by either uh, a private or a uh, board appointed attorney, we assign a, a polarity score. So words are either more associated with the privately retained attorneys and that represents the, you know, going up on the y-axis, or they're more used or more representative of the words and language used by the board-appointed attorneys, which is going down on the y-axis. The x-axis is just total frequency. So of these words, uh, how often do they appear in our data set? And just to give you a couple highlights, so for the board-appointed attorneys, we see uh, kind of like filler words like uh and um, are, act, are not just the most representative of the board appointed attorneys, they're also uh, very high frequency terms that we see in the data. For the re privately retained attorneys, we see more legal kind of case specific language. We see uh, case, we see um, other words, again, typically associated with, uh, you know, defending and describing uh, a lawsuit or, or, or sorry, um, a case. So we have this kind of like, it's not just that, um, what this shows is that it's not just that the privately retained attorneys are more likely to help their, their clients get parole. It's just, there's a substantively qualitatively different kind of tenor and experience happening in those meetings that you can see through language using uh, natural language processing tools. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and this is our, our last kind of key high level finding. And, you know, again, we see that uh, the privately retained attorneys, they have, uh, they use different language. They're more likely to get uh, their candidate, their client um, parole. But we also see that Black and Latinx uh, parole candidates are the least likely to retain private counsel. So what we want to, you know, what we want to like really point out with all of these results is that it's not just the fact that race is a strong predictor of whether or not you get parole. It's every single mechanism in the system is strongly correlated with race. Um, so this is, you know, this is going to be important work uh, moving forward. And um, yeah, there's, I, th I think the implications should be fairly obvious. Mm -hmm. I'll pass it back. Yeah. So for. Um... Uh, to sort of situate some of this uh, research back to the policy implications of parole, I want to invite Keith or take a, 
uh, crack at this first question and then I'll uh, take a moment to talk about the second. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's hard to, to <laughs> refocus after what you just ended with, AJ. I'm like, yeah. it, it seems like it should be obvious, but here we are. I mean, I think that the, the um, this question of what it would look like if the system worked, I mean, um, it's, it's hard because we look at, despite the data that is available and and despite you know there was a there was a recent nonpartisan report um in California by the legislative analyst office that highlighted these same inequities in the parole hearing process that uh, Kristen's talked about that Ada just talked about um despite what seems obvious there there may not be enough political will to to make even modest improvements to the process right now, um, that's 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 very frustrating. It's upsetting. Um, I I think the people who are in charge of the process here in California are, I mean, ultimately they're they're betraying the trust of people who believe in a fair process, and and I think even the 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 hopes of people here in California who think that that we as a state should be leading the charge to address what I think is, uh, you know, one of the greatest contributors to mass incarceration that no one really talks about. And instead, we have what is the most promising recent legislation, which is a current bill, SB 81, authored by Senators Skinner and, and Becker. It's at risk of being, you know, watered down to next to nothing and then vetoed by the governor anyway. So I, I think, uh, if the system worked, I think you'd remove the governor from the process. Um, we know the state of Maryland did that recently. I think California is one of, I think, only two states. Um, Oklahoma is the other one that we're aware of in which the governor can override decisions of the parole board. Um, I think the politicization of this process and the people stuck in it um, is going to condemn this to, a, you know, to its current fate for a very long time. I also think that if the system worked, you'd have um, a person who is subject to this this process of parole consideration that they would have they would have confidence that if they follow the rules, if they participate in relevant programs that that address their needs, and and if they transform themselves while in prison, that it would they would lead to release. Uh, instead, we've got a, a state parole board that thinks. Um, that it's a success that only 14% of the scheduled parole hearings last year resulted in parole grants, 14%. Uh, I think um, this discretion that Kristen talked about and we've been talking about today, in the absence of any objective basis for making predictions will always lead to bias. It always has. And I think it will continue to do that. So we, we've got to eliminate the, the discretion, take the subjectivity out of this process and make it less political, if that's even possible. Thanks. That's a tall, tall order. Um, I think that, uh, and thinking about how the recon approach can help achieve that aim, I want to be very clear that um, it is just one tool among many, many that are needed, because as Keith mentioned, the political hurdles and making change in policy change in the realm of parole release is very difficult. Um, and I think uh, Keith and his organization at Uncommon Law do an enormous amount of work to move that dial. And a lot of that comes from the voices of um, people who have been released through the parole process and are doing great things in the community. Um, and those uh, voices, I think, are really driving the reform and should be um, central. And so I speak very humbly as an academic with a technological tool um, that that is um, just a piece of a uh, an enormous amount of work that's being done to help reform parole in California. And the unique piece I think that we can provide is um, data about how the current system is working and not working. 
Um, I started out describing the recon approach as having, you know, this reconnaissance piece and the reconsideration piece. And our decision to not do reconsideration without reconnaissance has been underscored and um, uh, really affirmed by what we found in doing the reconnaissance work. We can't uh, sort of expect real change to come by identifying anomalous cases in a system where the, the patterns of decisions are telling us that there's injustice going on at a more structural level. Um, and so I think the biggest thing we have to offer right now is that reconnaissance work and getting some of these findings out um, so that the legislature can better understand the injustice that we're seeing in this system. Um, and in regard to having promise in other jurisdictions, I think it's important just to um, keep in mind how difficult it is to get data about parole release decision-making. We have transcripts in California, um, which need to a lot of work to be processed to extract all of this information and data. In some jurisdictions, we don't even have transcripts. Um, so I think uh, that data transparency is key to getting this approach to, to work in other places. And I will stop there. And I think it is time for questions and answers. I just wanted to put um, just our contact info. The bios are in uh, the Zoom chat. Um, and yeah. I'll turn it over for questions. Great, thank you, everyone. This is, that was really phenomenal. So we're going to go to Q and A, um, and Zoe's going to read out the questions um, from the Q and A. And folks, feel free to drop questions in the in the Q and A room. Uh, I'll pass it to Zoe. Thank you so much, Terrence, and thank you to our panelists. Um, this first question doesn't go to anyone in particular. Any of you can answer. Um, someone was curious as to how you determined ethnicity of the parole candidates, whether or not that was indicated in the transcripts themselves, or whether there was another data set that you were aligning with the transcripts to determine ethnicity. I can answer that. It's the um, not in the transcripts, uh, or at least not reliably in every transcript. And so we had to request that from the Board of Parole Hearings. They initially said no, we had to file a lawsuit to get it, and then they did provide it. And it is the um, ethnicity as designated by the Department of Corrections. I, I wanna, I think Kristen's kind of selling herself short here. She fought for two years to get that data because the parole board said things like, oh, we don't have it, we don't have access to it, and then said, oh, no, it's it's a violation of the privacy interest of parole applicants if we give it to you. So we, we, we're looking out for parole candidates. We shouldn't have to give that up. The court ultimately said it was nonsense because it always was. And, and what we've seen, I think, is that the parole board has always been afraid of data transparency when it comes to race, because they know what their commissioners do. They just been refusing to acknowledge and address it, address it for a long time. And I'm, I'm looking forward to even more and more consistent um, access to, to data so we can tell the full story and they can stop lying about it, frankly. I just want to also give credit. The Electronic Frontier Foundation represented us pro bono in that lawsuit to get the data. Um, I don't think we could have done it without their their help. So that was integral. Um, and also to uh, the folks at Stanford, when I think a lot of researchers hit a roadblock like that, they say, oh, let's just do the study without race or let's use some kind of proxy. They said, no, we're, we didn't come in here just to do a study, we came to help trans, you know, help with reforming parole. And if the way to do that is to sue them and get the data, that's what we're going to do. Um, so I, I wanted to give them credit for that decision. Thank you for this uh, for that answer. Uh, the next questions are about the commissioners. So there's actually two uh, that came up. So the first question is whether or not commissioners are randomly assigned. And then the second question is, in your upcoming paper, are you going to be naming the commissioners that you studied? 
Well, I, I could say that they are not randomly assigned. So some commissioners will spend, do more hearings at maximum security prisons that have much lower grant rates and others will be at, um, at less high security prisons of their higher grant rates. And so in our regression analysis and in another kind of statistical analysis, we control for that. And we find that there's still substantial variability in commissioner grant rates that's not explained by all those different kind of non-random assignments. Um, and no, we will not be naming the commissioners. Um, it's a decision that we made to, uh, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. You can talk more about it if you want. <laughs> Okay, this next question is also for any of you. Um, so the question is whether or not there is a trade off in using machine learning in these efforts, um, the concern being that machine learning will become further entrenched as a go to technology in these spaces, um, despite the fact that it has had corresponding harms in other contexts for marginalized communities. Hey, maybe I can jump in on this one. From my point of view, I think you know, machine learning is ultimately a collection of tools that enable people to do things or, or they enable people to claim to do things. A lot of people claim they can predict recidivism when it doesn't really make any sense, as Keith was arguing. Um, in some ways, I see this work as almost like a defense. We need to get these tools to the hands of advocates so they can have the same power to represent sort of the system uh, that everyone else is using, these private companies are using um, and so does that sort of entrench ML in the system? You know, maybe, but I think it's hard to put that kind of genie back in the bottle. And I think we need more and more ways to sort of direct these tools um, for reform as opposed to sort of automated decision-making that kind of tries to make this, you know, question of answering hard societal questions just go away to an algorithm. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to follow up after that. I'll just yeah, I, say, that, sorry, sorry, AJ. I, I just want to say, I I worry about anything that potentially takes the people out of the process. Um, you know, specifically the people most directly impacted who go through this, and um, they already come into a parole hearing with commissioners who've already decided who they are based on the paper that someone else wrote about them twenty years ago. Um, and they they fed that paper through their machinery of a of a um, risk assessment that tells them, oh yeah, this person's still dangerous. Now let's go through with this hearing. Uh, anything that that um, further entrenches that process is problematic. Um, so I, I think it is very important that we use tools like this to analyze, to understand, to describe what's actually happening, um, but not to prescribe necessarily what should happen in any individual case. And I'll say um, when we were just thinking about the recon approach, our goal was to develop a tool that is only what we call post hoc, meaning after the decision is made. It is a tool to scrutinize what the government is has done. It is not a tool for the government to use itself. And so... Um, I think it's important, um, you know, technology is a tool to think about who has the power to use that tool. And I think it's important that um, not just the government has all these tools um, that we as uh, stakeholders who are outside of that system are using all the technological tools that we can to scrutinize the government's decision making and their power. Hey, thank you for that. Um, our next question is also for anybody. Uh, the question is, did your analysis find any differences in parole grants by gender or gender identity? If so, how did gender and race interact? I can speak a little bit to that. One thing, I don't know if you if anyone notices on the slide with the speech patterns in the board appointed attorneys and the private attorneys is that among the private attorneys, some of the, the words that were more frequently used were she and her. And that's because we did find that um, uh, 
women are more likely to retain private attorneys in the system. Um, and uh, we haven't fully explored that um, or yet thought how it interacts with race. I will say that the population of parole candidates is predominantly men. Um, and so there is a big class imbalance um, in that uh, it makes it a bit harder to um, study gender, but we're going to do it. I just wanted to to flag that it's not that the population sizes are very, very different. Okay, our next question also for anyone to answer um, is, did you notice variability in grants for candidates whose commitment offense occurred in a county where the DA is a lifer unit? Um, which they define as a unit that generally has a policy to oppose uh, parole for individuals that are sentenced to life. We haven't dug into that. What we do find is that um, a person is less likely to be granted parole if the district attorney opposes parole. We do have the county of commitments in the period of time 2007 to 2019. Those policies would have changed over time, I expect. Um, uh, so that would be one challenge to answering the question that the person posed. But I will say that one reason why we invested so much in using natural language processing to extract data from these transcripts, rather than just relying on the sort of traditional social science method of, hey, you take a sample and you know you look at 500 hearings, you find all that, is that we want ultimately to be a continually updating system. So we haven't gotten there yet, but I want it to be the case that at the end of each year, I can say, hey, give me the transcripts for these years, run it through our pipeline. And then we'll be able to answer questions that may be relevant in that year that we had no idea about three years before. So something like this. So if you know a DA decided to adopt this policy and we wanted to look at, well, did the adoption of that particular policy in this particular county make a difference? We wouldn't have to employ a whole another army of research assistants to pull data from transcripts and take a long time to answer that question. The idea of developing this NLP pipeline is that we will be able to answer highly specific questions like that as they arise continually over time. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So I'm actually going to ask the one that just came in. Uh, what are the most impactful next questions that a researcher could address to build upon the excellent work that you all have done here? Kristen Healer, are you about to say something? <laughs> there's so many, there's so many, we need help to answer them. Um, I've talked a lot though, so I want to <laughs> give others a, an opportunity to take that one. I, I, I can quickly just jump in like, um, so I think like, one is like, as we mentioned, like expanding upon the analyses of race and inequality in this process. But I think there's also this opportunity to see how does the way that um, race is even categorized, how could that also be influencing results? If you think of California, there's a long history of discrimination and prejudice specifically against uh, Mexican Mexicans and Mexican Americans but they're part of just this broad kind of like Latinx category or Hispanic category. What happens if you, I mean, we can't do this, we don't have the data, but like what kind of patterns could be lurking underneath um, in terms of like, you know, using these large aggregated categories and how does that kind of like complicate our understandings of race and inequality in parole? Jake, I think you want to jump in. So I will stop. Uh, I was going to say from the, the kind of technical AI side of things, I think we sort of hit the points. We need algorithms that work faster, better, and more real time. Um, and I think we're looking at sort of large language models as maybe a chance to improve on our existing processes. So this original work was not sort of chat GPT based. Um, and I think there's a tremendous number of open questions about how to do that reliably and you know safely and responsibly. Um, and I think you know, that's that's where we're spending some of our time. And I think it's really useful for, for not just this, but a lot of other projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I, if I could mention something on that front as well. When we started um, uh, thinking that the, we saw that the tech was developed enough that this was um, 
in Catalina's words, you know, I have a hammer and I can, you know, <laughs> whack it at the transcripts and get the data. We, it turns out we don't really have the right kind of hammer yet. Um, there is work in the development of NLP that needs to happen to be able to extract data better. Like, so there's a bunch of variables that we couldn't get from the transcripts given the current state of technology um, that are really important to be able to get in the next round. So I think that AI development is really important. And it, I think it also, um, to connect with race as well, something that we haven't done yet that we would like to do is um, test to see whether our, ex our NLP extraction is equally good at extracting data from transcripts of, um, let's say, uh, individuals whose uh, first language is English compared to not English. Um, there may be in the extraction tools that we're using problems of race and ethnicity and maybe gender that we may be getting better extraction results, more reliable extraction results from certain groups. And we don't know if that's happening or not. I think it's an example of applying the same kind of um, careful thought about inequity, not just to our sort of results in the parole process, but to the very method that we're using to make, to um, investigate that. You all, I think we're at time. We're um, actually two minutes ahead, which is great. Um, thank you, Kristen, AJ, Jake, and Keith. Thank you, thank you. This has been a hugely informative conversation, and we appreciate you sharing your research, your findings, um, and your uh, more about your innovative methods and your vision for advocacy. Um, we thank you enormously. If folks have questions for you, um, Kristen, would you mind putting up the contacts right again just so they can yes. get that information? And the recording um, of this webinar will be available on our center's website, and that will be up probably by the end of the week. Um, so we thank all of you participants for taking time as well. And we'll just leave uh, this up for a second, and we'll we'll close out momentarily. Any final words, Kristen? If you email me in the next two weeks, there's a, a strong chance I won't get back to you because I'm expecting a baby in two weeks. Um, so if you want an immediate answer to your questions, please make sure you CC Jake and AJ. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you again, everybody. Take care to all of our attendees, participants. Thank you as well.